Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation as a part of the NELMS Institute Lightning Talk series. My name is Boyhav Chatterjee, and I'm an assistant professor in the department of ECE at the University of Florida, and a member of the Warren B. NELMS Institute for the Connected World. The topic of my presentation today is energy efficient, secure communication and sensing for the Internet of Bodies. And I'll mostly talk about the physical layer implementations of it. Now, there would be a few recurring themes throughout this talk. How to efficiently and securely communicate among wearables, how to do the same for implants, and what could be some efficient sensing architectures. But first, it is important to address what we mean by the Internet of Bodies and how it is a part of the Internet of Things. Now, today's Internet of Things is at the juncture of Moore's Law and Shannon's Law. Moore's law over the years has enabled cheaper computation on smaller and smaller form factors, while Shannon's law has continued to increase the channel capacity by supporting high bandwidth communication links. But the major challenge in such IoT devices have always been the energy efficiency. And as the number of devices per user increases over time, the energy efficiency of these devices become all the more important, both from the point of view of user experience, as well as the economy that drives the market. To that end, if we consider the fact that these devices, when used in, on, or around the body, share a common medium, which is our body itself, it can open up new possibilities of energy efficient sensing, processing, and communication. Imagine communication among multiple devices on your body without any need to turn on Bluetooth, which consumes about a milliwatt of power when transferring data at one Mbps. We have been extensively exploring the concept of using the human body in a wire-like fashion for data communication. And for such scenarios, people started using this new terminology called Internet of Bodies, where we envision that the Internet of Things will meet the human body to transform our lives by empowering human-machine interaction as well as collaboration. Now, as a subset of IoT, one of the major research areas in the last decade has been low power body area networks for devices ranging from healthcare sectors to consumer electronics. The power consumption of such devices is usually dominated by the communication power. And this is where our research of transferring the data through the human body comes in for both wearables as well as implantable devices. And that brings us to the overview of this presentation. Today's sensor nodes have three primary operations, sensing, processing, and communication. To holistically achieve better energy efficiencies in the sensor node, we need to reduce the power consumption in each of these sectors, as well as working on system level trade-offs. However, for this presentation, we'll only talk about the energy efficient and secure communication techniques using the human body as a medium. We'll quickly take a look at efficient time domain sensing, and then I'll briefly discuss my other research interests in terms of in-sensor analytics and hardware security. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about my current and future research directions. Now, the reason why I plan to simultaneously work on these seemingly unrelated topics is that instead of having individual siloed developments in each of these domains, we want an overall improvement in the energy per unit information in these devices. And that requires reduction in the energy per bit, as well as the number of bits we need to represent unit amount of information. Improving the energy per bit requires better sensing and communication techniques, while reduction in the number of bits per unit information needs better in-sensor analytics. Now, with this background in mind, let's take a look at the first part of today's talk, efficient communication. And this is the outline for part one. We'll briefly discuss the need for energy efficient communication in IOB, and then introduce the idea of human body communication and its different modalities namely capacitive and galvanic HBC. We'll also take a look at the physical security aspects of HBC and the limits of power consumption. Finally, we'll take a look at one example, biphasic HBC for brain implants. Now, the most important takeaway from this part of the presentation would be that the energy efficiency and physical security of HBC both are orders of magnitude better than traditional wireless. Now, the need for such energy efficiencies arise from the requirement that many of the devices in IoT and body area networks are envisioned to function on harvested energy. 
And if we take a look into the available energy sources in practical applications and form factors, we see that the maximum available power is in the range of only 50 to 100 microwatts, while traditional wireless needs about milliwatt for one Mbps data transfer, leading to an energy efficiency of about one nanojoule per bit. And this is true for all the different modes of wireless data transfer. However, if we look at wireline line techniques for high-speed IO, we see that they achieve an energy efficiency of about one picojoule per bit today, because the energy um, in that channel is much better controlled. The channel loss is much better controlled, and the communication is mostly broadband. This gives rise to the fundamental question. Can we achieve wireline-like efficiencies even in wireless? And as it turns out, if we use the human body as a wire without any physical wire, of course, then we can do much better than traditional wireless. To start with, we explored and created a signal transfer model from the transmitter to the receiver through the body, which happens to be the first biophysical model for HBC at electroquasi-static frequencies of up to a few tens of megahertz. Most of the signal transfer happens through the low resistance tissues below the skin surface. Now, in terms of the model, we have the transmitter, the electrode capacitance, the skin model, the resistive tissue model. And as the signal comes back again towards the receiver, we have the skin, electrode, and receiver load models. But interestingly, the electrical loop is not closed as we don't have a common ground between the transmitter and the receiver. So how is the closed path forming for the communication to happen? And as it turns out that there is always a capacitive coupling to the earth's ground for both the transmitter, receiver, and the human body. And that forms the electrical closed loop. This is exactly what capacitive HVC does. We have a single-ended excitation and pickup at both the transmitter and receiver. And the channel transfer function can be found to be the ratio of the parasitic capacitance to ground at the transmitter with the body capacitance, and that multiplied with the ratio of parasitic capacitance to ground at the receiver with the load capacitance. Being a ratio of capacitances, this transfer function is independent of frequency, and hence providing a broadband channel. This is unlike the 50 ohm radiative communication in traditional wireless, which creates a narrowband channel and needs to go to higher carrier frequencies for high data rates. One interesting thing to note that uh, this capacitive HBC is applicable only for wearables, and it does not work well in implants. This is because for the implant, the transmitter is fully surrounded by the tissue, and hence this return path cap from the transmitter to the Earth's ground does not exist, which makes the received voltage almost equal to zero, as shown for the brain implant on the right. For that, there is a different modality called galvanic HBC, where instead of doing single-ended excitation and pickup, we use differential signaling. The signal transfer happens through dipole coupling, which can again be shown as ratio of geometries leading to a wideband channel. The transmitter creates electric field lines, and part of those lines are picked up by the receiver. Now, this mode works for implants. But there is one small challenge. Since the tissue is highly conductive, there will be a DC current flow between the two electrodes of the transmitter through the tissue if the signal is not DC balanced. We'll come back to this issue later. But first, I'd like to show some of our capacitive HVC ICs developed over the last four years. Previous research had treated HVC as one of the applications of 50 ohm communication, leading to narrowband channels and high power consumption due to its radiative nature. With help of our biophysical model, we showed how to leverage a wider bandwidth where the transfer function is just a ratio of capacitances, leading to much better energy efficiencies for both broadband and narrowband implementations. Our IC1 from JSSC19 was the first sub-10 picojoule per bit implementation demonstrating 30 Mbps broadband HVC. Later, in JSSC21 and 22, we also showed narrowband but micro earth level implementation of human body communications. These use uh, parallel resonance for reducing the power consumption. Finally, IC version 4 presented in ICCC 2022 utilizes adiabatic switching to break the capacity power consumption limits and achieve the state of the art energy efficiencies. And in essence, we can achieve about 100x better energy efficiencies than traditional wireless using HVC. 
Now, along with the energy benefits, I would also like to point out another significant advantage of HBC in terms of the physical security. Since HBC is fully electrical in nature for quasi-static frequencies, this is up to a few tens of megahertz, the private space is much smaller than traditional wireless. If we do a leakage signal correlation analysis or a bit error rate analysis of both W band and HBC over distance, we see that the W band signals are available with enough signal power even at a distance of a few meters, while HBC signals die out in a few tens of centimeter range from the transmitter. This analysis show that the EQS or electroquasi-static human body communication is about 30 times more secure than W band or wireless body area network in terms of the signal availability to an attacker. This is also demonstrated in the bottom figure where we transmit the blue circle in the transmitter, which is on the left hand to the receiver one. Receiver 2, even if it is very close to receiver 1, does not receive the blue circle because the communication is happening strictly through touch and not through EM radiation. Now, the previous examples were HBC for wearables. What about HBC for deep implants, such as neural nodes? Today's brain implants, as demonstrated by the latest product from Neuralink, uses tethered connections to the electrodes inside the brain. The processing device is fused with the skull by drilling a hole into it. But imagine the possibilities that we can unfold if we can remove these tethered wires so that the electrodes can pick up data from anywhere in the brain and send them wirelessly. This motivates the need for untethered communication in neural systems. And in the recent years, people have looked into multiple modalities of wireless data transfer from a neural node, including RF, inductive, ultrasonic, optical, and magnetoelectric methods. But these systems either have a large amount of tissue absorption or suffer from high transduction losses because of conversion of electrical energy to some other form of energy. On the other hand, our approach of biphasic quasi-static HVC or BPQBC avoids such transduction losses and also achieves low power. The neural node is envisioned to communicate with a headphone-shaped hub placed on the skin outside. The implementation of our IC is shown at the bottom. This has a node volume of less than six millimeter cube with the SOC placed on a flexible polymid PCB, along with a storage capacitor, a signal electrode, and a reference electrode. To understand the working principle of BPQBC, let's revisit the galvanic HBC modality that utilizes differential excitation and pickup, and the signal is transferred through dipole coupling. However, for the implant, the transmitter sees the conductive tissue as a resistive load of about a kilo ohm or less, which creates a DC current between the two transmit electrodes through the tissue if they are not DC balanced. This increases the power consumption significantly. In the proposed BPQBC approach, a DC blocking cap is placed before the transmitter signal electrode, which blocks this DC current to minimize power. The signal conduction through AC current flow is similar to galvanic HBC. Hence, BPQBC takes advantage of both worlds. It has a low channel loss like galvanic HBC, leading to large received signal as shown in green. At the same time, it consumes low power, just like capacitive HBC, which in fact is 41 times lower than galvanic HVC at one megahertz, which is something that we have measured using our IC as a transmitting node. Additionally, BPQBC offers about 20 dB better channel loss than competing techniques because it is fully electrical and hence does not incur any transduction loss. Now, as for the key contributions, which we have mentioned in this slide, we identified the primary source of power consumption in a galvanic brain implant to be the tissue resistance which led to the use of a DC blocking capacitor to make the communication DC balanced and low power, while being the first fully electrical implementation of data transfer through the brain. And the major potential impact that this makes is in the domain of interrogatorless, fully untethered communication from a brain implant, and a demonstration video can be found in this link. This brings us to part two of this talk, which discusses our work on efficient sensing techniques, specifically time domain techniques for IOB. Now, if I am intuitively trying to explain why time domain architectures are gaining more interest in the recent years, I start with this comparison. For traditional voltage mode sensing, we need to fit 2 to the power n minus 1 number of levels for n bit resolution within the supply rails. As the VDD is reducing with technology scaling, both the resolution and dynamic range suffers. Additionally, for more, most of the low frequency sensing applications, including physiological signal acquisition, voltage mode architectures suffer from flicker noise. In contrast, time domain architectures convert the input signal to pulse widths of frequency 
of a two valued signal since active power consumption of a system is usually dominated by the f over ft ratio of the technology and a lower ratio usually results in lower power the efficiencies of time based systems become better with increasing ft as technology scales the flicker noise still remains a primary challenge though which most of the times become the limiter in the form of vco jitter will not go into the details and rather will move forward to some of my other research interests i have been heavily involved in a collaborative work on current domain signature attenuation hardware as a countermeasure against power side channel attacks power side channel attacks are carried out by measuring correlated fluctuations in the current drawn from the power line during any crypto operation and correlational analysis like cpa can find out the secret key for encryption essentially the idea here is to make the current drawn from the supply constant by placing a current source above the crypto engine which due to its high output resistance reduces the signatures present on the power traces similarly for em side channel attacks we figured out that the high level metals in a technology node leak more information and hence routing this crypto code only in the lower metal layers help making it more secure with this we were able to achieve more than a billion mtd or minimum traces to disclosure i have also led the rf puff based efforts in the past few years which can help in identifying known iot devices and attackers with zero overhead at the transmitter the idea is essentially bio inspired and stems from the observation of how humans identify others by just hearing their voice but we usually map each person with their voice signatures as an example if alice the intended speaker says i am alice and mallory an unintended speaker says no i am alice then the listener bob can identify the real alice just from her voice signatures if he is pre trained with it this is exactly what we do in rf puff any digital transmitter will have unintended analog and rf non ideality superimposed on the intended signals as sign signatures in the receiver side by embracing these non idealities we can in fact detect the transmitters with more than 99% accuracy additionally i have been involved in exploring in sensor analytics and techniques for system level energy improvements in iot devices here we see implementation of smart sensors throughout the purdue campus as part of a cross department effort involving over 40 faculty members and their students and i led the in sensor analytics subsystems that involved event driven communication with data communication data compression collaborative intelligence and context awareness finally coming to my current and future directions we are exploring the core design and integration of several emerging transducers with the sensor electronics somewhat like what we did for some of the radiation sensing applications that we did in the past but in a much larger scale where we are exploring the most energy efficient electronics for different types of transducers including potentiometric amperometric piezoelectric resistive capacitive or optical modalities one particular effort is toward building extremely stable on chip clocks with on chip and heterogeneously integrated resonators as part of a dod effort in terms of hbc we are exploring the prototyping and translation of devices using the human body as a medium for wearables and implants on hardware security we are exploring machine learning based or other low overhead detection of physical layer attacks such as side channel and fault injection attacks and their prevention mechanisms as well we can keep the countermeasure in sleep mode for the majority of operation and then it can be turned on whenever the ml core detects the attacks also taking inspiration from my previous work on hbc we are exploring wireline like high speed wireless links for body area network and iot which is likely to have applications in emerging 5g and 6g radios the baseband of such radios can can be more digital friendly just like in wild line to make them lower power now with this i thank you for your attention and hope you have enjoyed the talk thank you